Welcome back to Trader TV Live in conjunction with FIS. We've covered the preparation that investment managers, banks and risk managers can make ahead of a known market event, such as a rate hike or an election outcome. So now, let's talk about trading. Obviously, everybody's getting the same information at the same time in these events. Sean, let's... It probably gets a little faster than that. <laughs> 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 I wish that would It's a little bit bigger. <laughs> but, but, so, Sean, let's get back to you. What sort of pressure does that then create on your trading operations? I mean, you ha there's been... I mean, those of us who have been in the market, there's been several of those occasions this mm -hmm. year where you're just hit with something that, that's a wow. And... You, you want to re, I mean, I'm a hedge fund, so you know, I'm in the alpha collection business yeah. um, to show that I'm outperforming. And, and we've been able to outperform on some of these events um, um, by so part of it like asymmetry in, in our portfolio, like where we have you know, bought puts on the S&P that, that, that kick in, but also trading the CDS indices uh, after an event because we like the market the market is not as efficient as people like to think all the information is out there and immediately prices to where it's supposed to be yep. there's people are you know not pulling the trigger thinking about pulling the trigger then price forces people to pull the trigger and then you get the snowball effect so uh, being quick and being right are, are, are not as easy are easier said than done uh, but I mean that's been a big portion of our returns this year is, is, is being on top of things. Okay. And James, with long only positions, how is trading impacted during these periods? Sure thing. Just to, just to pick up on Sean's point there, you know, when you're dealing with macroeconomic kind of outturns and risk events, you've, yeah. you've got the very nature of interpretation. You're not often dealing with yes and no fact and, and, and non-fact. You are dealing with nuance and interpretation, and that adds a whole nother layer of complexity. But specifically on, on the point of the dealing desk, mm. um, you know, again, we're, we're medium to long term investors. My role is to build a portfolio which can benefit from as many possible future states of the world. I'm looking strategically. The vast majority of cases, these risk events should not be sufficiently destabilizing or shocking to, have, to sort of blow too big a hole in terms of the strategy. And so I'd like to think that most of the time our dealing desk won't be required to attempt to execute in the aftermath of an event. Yep. Um, but on those cases where it is, I'd also like to believe that actually we're taking profit from positions which have worked, and that means that we're the right side of the liquidity problem, because essentially that's what we are dealing with is liquidity. So if it is a situation where something has happened which is so shocking outside of a, of a sort of range of considerations for us going in, mm -hmm. and therefore we're having to say stop out of a position, and therefore we're going against the, the sort of liquidity tide, if you like, i.e. everybody's a seller and so are we, yeah. it's the job of the dealing desk to understand volatility, liquidity, the specific markets that we're trying to execute a position in, and therefore what is the right cost in terms of bid offer, what is the right price mm -hmm. for us to pay in order to, to get out of that position. Very good, thank you. And in this particular scenario of a rate change, um, either up or down, does that impact across instruments? And how do you trade to take effect of that? I mean, the, the, I'd say, you know, up until the beginning of this month, you had to synchronize rates are going to go to zero and never reflate again. Yes. And then in, you know, in the span of a week, you had the U.S. 10-year go from 160 to almost 2%. Uh, and, and it's come come back in. Uh, those those things matter because like you have the 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 growth versus value and on the equity side you have uh, 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 the the real estate stocks versus banks. Yeah. Uh, you have cyclicals in, in in my world that are starting to perform. Uh, you have MTNA in the market today, vastly oversubscribed for a new issue. So it does matter. Like we added last week was the first auto bond we bought all year. I've, I've, I've been short cyclicals and long uh, uh, CSPP bonds. Yep. And I, it, it does matter, this rate move matters because it's telling us something in a pretty synchronized fashion uh, across different asset class, or at least us, uh, it is telling us. So we, we've started to shift out of short cyclicals into more of a balanced cyclicals position based on that. Very good. And James, I mean, it depends on your mandates, doesn't it, as to what you can sure trade thing. or yeah. invest in? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the bulk of mandates that, that I manage are, are sort of bond and FX mandates. Mm -hmm. You know, some have more freedom uh, to use swaps and futures, for example. Largely, that's about efficient portfolio management, but, but obviously some opportunities do open up. But, you know, to echo, to echo Sean's point there as a macro thinker, you know, we've had instances in the last year or so where you see dramatic changes in how assets are reacting to various interest rate changes. You know, Sean's rightly touched on 
you know, bond proxy sectors within the equity market and how they've behaved like bonds and obviously in a rising yield environment, then suddenly you want to be in banks because the steeper curve is good for profits. If you go back to the back end of 2018, you know, the whole year up and, No, well, exactly. <laughs> it was scarring for me too, buddy. But, you know, the whole year really was about how everything was correlated in a positive fashion and had negative performance. And then Q4 was vastly different because of the perceived changes of monetary policy. Very good. And Matthias, I mean, during this process, during the live trading process, you have to capture and analyse data. How challenging is that? Well, I mean, if it is an event uh, that is, occurs, it's, it's very important that the... Uh, the uh, Things like uh, performance is okay in the trading system. Yeah. Of course, the, the, the dealers need to also figure out where the market is going. I mean, that's that's given. But they they get asked a lot of uh, maybe a lot of inquiries, a lot of orders uh, coming in, and they need to combine that with having reliable price feeds. They need to make sure that they, their gateways are up to venues and and, and exchanges, uh, and and still serving the, the the client activities for incoming RFQs and uh, and so on. So. The, the challenge is, uh, is to, 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 to do that, but, but also sometimes when these things happen, uh, there are a lot of flashing, but sometimes it, it can be good to take a step, step back and try to figure out where things are, yes. because maybe the first move in the, in the boont is not the right one. And uh, also if there's a shaky market, there, there's a lot of, uh, there are not so many bids out there. So, so it, 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 the sell side is sitting in a little bit in, in, a, in the same boat, uh, but uh, it's not like, the, they, they can end up in positions because they are, they are, uh, some of them are market makers, so have to give a market, market. so they m might end up in long and short positions that they haven't really analyzed and wanted to do when they enter the office in the morning. Mm. So they need to be, they need to be uh, on their toes uh, and have a trading system architecture that allows them to, to handle it. And this puts a lot of, um, lot of um, requirements on the performance side to be able to handle a massive amount of trades and when there's a lot of trade activity, you need to be able to, to calculate uh, your credit sensitivity buckets, for example, and uh, at the same time as you're serving the clients. So the performance is always a topic, and that's something that we as FIS is, is uh, constantly uh, improving. And, and of course, liquidity is poor in most fixed income markets at the moment. So that's becoming increasingly challenging. I'm, I'm guessing that, uh, is that something that um, the discussion between traders and portfolio managers, has that increased as liquidity has decreased in order to manage the risks for you in this process? Yeah, it's, uh, massively so. I mean, yeah. essentially the regulatory environment, the regulations which we've seen as a response to what happened in 2007 and eight has absolutely changed the way that banks operate. And depending yep. on which asset class you're talking about, the hit to liquidity, the change in liquidity conditions has been, broadly speaking, dramatic. When you then potentially throw in uh, a risk event, uh, an economic event, a volatility event, mm. then what you see is that liquidity can dry up absolutely dramatically. So we want to lean on our dealing desk as much as possible for info all the time because yeah. they're you know, in touch with the market on an ongoing basis, but particularly in, in the current environment, yeah. That's been great, thank you very much. I'd like to thank Sean George, James Athey and Matthias Remnifjord for their time and insights and of course you for watching. To watch the next section of Trader TV Live, go to tradertv.net.